So, hi everyone, my name is Arissa and I'm one of the tutors with Lantana. So I do mostly chemistry, it's one of my favourite topics. And today we're going to be looking at topic eight, acids and bases. This is our first video for topic eight, and we're going to be looking predominantly at 8.1, which is the first SL subtopic. So let's get started then. One of the main things, um, if you're talking about the, if we're talking about the SL syllabus, is Bronsted-Lowry theory. So Bronsted-Lowry theory is all about the transfer of a hydrogen or a proton. So we're looking at a couple of definitions. So we define an acid as a proton donor and a base as a proton acceptor. So an acid, in order to be a proton donor, needs to be able to dissociate and release a hydrogen ion. A base, on the other hand, to be able to accept a hydrogen ion, it needs to have a lone pair of electrons to be able to bond with that incoming hydrogen. This might make a little bit more sense if we look at an example over here. So this is a reaction between HCl, hydrochloric acid, and H2O, water. There are two main questions that you need to be able to answer based on a reaction such as this one. So the first question is, what are the Bronsted-Lowry acid and base here? And the second one is about conjugate pairs. So let's look at this reaction in a bit of greater depth then. So if we're talking about the acid first, so remember the acid is the proton donor, it's got a hydrogen that it wants to give. So we're looking at the reactants for which reactant has donated a hydrogen. And in this case, you can see that HCl, hydrochloric acid, has donated its hydrogen, it's H+, and therefore it's become Cl-. minus. So we call that a conjugate pair. So HCl is going to be your acid and Cl- minus is going to be its conjugate base. Now let's look at our base. So H2O is going to be our base on the reactant side. It's accepted an additional hydrogen or a proton and it's become H3O+. Plus. So therefore we can regard H2O as our base and H3O plus as our conjugate acid. So the best way to spot a conjugate pair is always to look at the transfer of the hydrogen or the proton. So I've got a bit of an additional question for you. Are H2SO4 and SO4 2 minus conjugate pairs then? So H2SO4 is sulfuric acid and SO4 2 minus is a derivative of sulfuric acid. So the answer to this question is no, they are not conjugate pairs because even though H2SO4 has lost two protons to become SO4 2 minus, it doesn't fit our definition of a conjugate pair. So remember, a conjugate pair can only involve the transfer of just one proton. Good. Okay, so let's kind of put that knowledge to the test. So here I've taken a screenshot of a past paper question. Uh, this one is from paper one in 2016, and I've tried to include the um, course code um, at the top right so you can kind of search for the paper if you'd like. So let's have a look at this reaction over here. So you've got CH3COOH. So that over there, that's going to be ethanoic acid. I'll just write that out, ethanoic acid. And then it's reacting with H2O, and then it's making CH3COO minus and H3O plus. So we're looking for the conjugate pairs. So let's have a look at CH3COH. So remember, it's an acid, and therefore it's going to donate that hydrogen, and in the process, become CH3COO minus. So that's going to be our acid, and this over here is going to be our conjugate base. Um, on the other hand, H2O has gained a hydrogen to become H3O plus. So that's going to be your base, and that's going to be your conjugate acid. So now let's look at sort of the answers. And the only real answer that fits is C. So 26 is going to be C. So you're looking for the transfer of just one proton. Good. Let's move on then. So you might be asking me, how do I know the formula for sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, etc., um, etc.? 
what I've done on this slide is I've taken a screenshot of all the polyatomic ions that the IB expects you to know of in topic four, so bonding. So these are really important polyatomic ions that are worth remembering. They are formulas and they are charges specifically. So these polyatomic ions are really important in deriving your acids because if I show you an example, so let's look at NO3 minus. So this is what we call a nitrate ion. Whenever something has an eight at the end of it, that means it's bonded with oxygen. So here you can see nitrogen bonded with oxygen. We derive nitric acid by adding as many hydrogens as it takes to balance out the charge of the nitrate ion. So in this case, if the charge is minus one, we're gonna add one hydrogen, which has a charge of uh, one plus, to be able to balance out that formula. I'll show you another example. In carbonic acid, if the charge is two minus, we want a charge of two plus to balance that out. So that's gonna be two hydrogens. Again, here as well for sulfuric acid, two hydrogens. Here we've got a charge of three minus, so we want three hydrogens to balance it out. And that's how you derive your acids from this list of polyatomic ions. These are some really key acids to kind of bear in mind um, for, the, uh, for topic eight for acids and bases. They're the ones that you get examined on most frequently. Okay, good, let's move on then. So we've got a couple of other terms that we need to tackle as well. Amphiprotic and amphipathic. So when we look at these terms, I want you to think of amphi as kind of reminding you of amphibian. So an amphibian is something that lives on land and in water. So amphi just means both. So in this case, if something is amphiprotic, Protic stands for proton. This means that it can both give and accept a proton. And as we saw earlier, this means that it can act as a bronsted lowry acid and a bronsted lowry base. So amphiprotic is all about the transfer of a proton. Amphoteric, on the other hand, is a bit of a broader concept. So amphoteric is simply anything that can act as an acid and a base. For those of you that are doing higher level, you also learn about Lewis theory of acids and bases. So something that can act as an acid and a base according to Lewis theory, we consider that amphoteric. So I know that's a little bit confusing in terms of the difference. So I've kind of put a little Venn diagram over here. So I want you to think of B as anything that is amphoteric. So this circle is just anything that can act as an acid or a base. A specifically is something that can act as an acid or a base, but only with regards to hydrogen transfer. So only hydrogen transfer here and kind of everything else for your wider circle of B. Right, so let's put that knowledge to the test then. So I've got a question for you. So name a compound from topic three periodicity that is amphoteric. And your hint is that it's an oxide of period three. So I'm giving you a bit of a throwback to when we spoke about trends in period three. And the main trend that I'm concerned about here is the acids, uh, acid base properties of elements uh, of oxides of period three. So if you remember um, from topic three, all our metal oxides, so sodium and magnesium, we consider these basic. All our, sorry, see, and all our non-metal oxides, so phosphorus to chlorine, we consider these acidic. So we derive phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, and hydrochloric acid from these. So we've got basic oxides that are metals, non-metal oxides are acidic, and our amphoteric species is actually aluminium oxide. So aluminium oxide. Now, is that the formula of aluminium oxide though? So not quite. So we're going to try and just think about how you're going to balance this out. So aluminium is in group three, and this means that it's got a charge of three plus. Oxygen is in group six, which means that it's got a charge of two 
minus. So when we balance this out, we always have to look for the lowest common denominator, which in this case is going to be 6. So we're going to multiply 3 plus by 2 to make plus 6 over here. And we're going to multiply the oxygen by 3 to make a total charge of minus 6. So Al2O3 is aluminium oxide, and that's a species that is worth remembering that is amphoteric. It is not amphiprotic, however, because it doesn't have any hydrogens to give. So let's put that knowledge to the test one more time. So I've got another past paper screenshot, this time from 2017. And they've asked you which species produced by the successive dissociations of phosphoric acid are amphi protic. So now we're looking at something that can both give and accept a proton. So let's look at A to start off with. So HPO4 2 minus. So we know that HPO4 minus, uh, PO4 2 minus, has a hydrogen that it could give, it could dissociate and release this hydrogen, and it could also accept another hydrogen. So this is amphi protic, and so therefore this one over here is also amphi protic. Let's look at the next species, PO4 3 minus. Now we have a problem. PO4 3 minus doesn't have any hydrogens that it could give, so it wouldn't be able to act as a bronsted lowry acid. And therefore, this is going to be the wrong answer, so we're cancelling options A and C. Now let's look at B. So we've got to look at H2PO4 minus. H2PO4 minus, it's got a hydrogen that it could give, and at the same time, it could also receive a hydrogen to reconstitute phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. So the right answer in this case is going to be B, because both of these different species are amphiprotic. Good. Okay, well, that was the it for 8.1. I hope that was useful. If you'd require any additional help, don't forget that Lanterna also offers online private tuition for one-to-one -one support. And we also run revision courses about three times a year. And um, so if you're interested, definitely have a look on our website. So I'll see you again for our next video on 8.2. Bye.